At, at the end of uh, the lessons on repentance, we're going to have like a conclusion, and we're going to uh, present our um, our repentance and faith, our, the article of faith itself, and so and we'll have a lesson on that as well. Uh, but so we're looking forward to that. But until then, we just finished up in Acts. We finished talking about how repentance uh, was the state of mind in which Paul the apostle uh, did his ministry. Uh, once he, at the moment he uh, realized he was persecuting Christ, he humbled himself before the Lord, and then uh, his whole ministry was exhibited of that humbleness before the Lord, and how that he, in all things, tried to uh, live after Christ, and to have that matter of humility, a humbleness of mind uh, in him. And so now we're going to go on to uh, one of his first books that he wrote, one of his first letters that he wrote doctrinally uh, to the early churches, and that would be the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Romans is kind of dealing with this fact that all people are in sin, all people need salvation, and it doesn't matter what covenant you are in. If you are in, under the law, you know, with the Jewish people, the Israelite people, they were under the Jewish national covenant, or the Israelite covenant, uh, and they uh, thought themselves, because they were the servants of the Lord by physical birth, and by, uh, by the circumcision of the flesh, that that counted for their eternal salvation. Well, I was born into this covenant, and, and uh, this covenant is what saves me, this covenant is what makes me saved before God. But then, but then Paul explains very carefully in Romans that it's not about whether you're in or out of the national covenant. It's not about whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. Uh, what, what causes you to die is not... Uh, whether you're in or out of the covenant, but what causes you to die is your sin, is is your rebellion against God, is your uh, state of rebellion from from knowing to do right and doing wrong and not continuing in uh, the right path. And so Romans explains very carefully that uh, the judgment of God is against all people that do ungodliness. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you if your nation has a covenant with God. Or if your nation is a Gentile nation, then they never had a covenant whatsoever. Uh, because uh, what we're dealing with in salvation is has nothing to do with the covenants, like personal covenants, national covenants, and all those things. It has to do with the testaments. It has to do with uh, all people being under sin because of Adam's sin. And, and, and that New Testament being written so that until the uh, crucifixion of Christ... Uh, there would be a provision made for fellowship with God until that could be done. Uh, and so so they took the provision made for their fellowship, their national fellowship with God, so that they could, uh, they could cover their sins uh, as to being, we're good to go. Uh, rather, they, realized, they, they didn't realize that your sins aren't supposed to be covered, but they're supposed to be cleansed. And so the Old Testament covered the sins, and then their uh, national covenant made fellowship with God and so forth so that they could have peace with God and have the blessings of God early in their lives, uh, and so that they would technically have the kingdom of God on their nation uh, as the servants of God, servants of the kingdom. But then in the New Testament, when they refused to go into the New Testament and cleanse their sins that had been covered, uh, they as a nation were dispersed. They didn't have the benefits of the New Testament. And so here in, uh, in the book of Romans, we have two instances of the word repent. And the first instance is in Romans chapter 2. It says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So we're going to focus on that phrase, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Uh, and so in the book of Romans, it talks about the long suffering of God, how that he suffered long his creation and that uh, he is allowing people to uh, have time for repentance. That's what the Old Testament was all about. It was about uh, giving people a covering uh, so that they could, uh, until that perfect sacrifice could be made, uh, and until they could have faith in that perfect sacrifice, uh, they would be covered of their sins and so judgment wouldn't just come right away. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. And it goes down that spiral of sin, talking about all the sins that people do and that God suffers very long with. Uh, and just uh, 
thinking about before the flood how that their sins and, the, and they became exceedingly sinful and, and the earth was covered with sin and, and God was grieved to the heart that he allowed it to go on for so long and he gave them a space for repentance but they didn't except for Noah and his family and so the flood came in that and so here in this passage uh, Paul is asking them don't you know that the reason why God hasn't already judged you hasn't already passed you know, we're condemned already. There's a sentence already passed, but he hasn't carried out the judgment yet. And so he's explaining to them, uh, hey, don't you know that the goodness of God is, is leading you to repentance? He's drawing you to himself. You know, lift up Christ and all men shall come uh, to him. Uh, is drawing him. He is being patient. He's giving them a call. He's giving them a command. Uh, <clears throat> and so in Rome, is talking about the sins that people have committed and what they are against. And it's revealing, it's revealing the faith of, of, of God. Uh, in chapter 2, he says, Therefore, in verse 1, Therefore art thou inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art, that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, and condemnest thyself, for that thou judgest, doest the same things. Uh, you see, the Jews at that time were looking at the Gentiles. They look at those sinners, look at those ungodly people, look at those... It was like the Pharisee standing up in pride saying, look at all the things that I do, how righteous I am, but look at this publican over there. He, he's all this wicked sinner, and he steals from people, and he, he works for evil governments and so forth. Uh, and he was looking about everything that he did, but then chapter 2 after chapter 1, of course, we don't have time to explain all of Romans. We'll deal with that as we get to the book. Uh, but in regards to repentance, he's saying, hey, uh, you guys who are judging are just as bad as people you're judging. Uh, because your sins may be different, but you still offended God in different ways. Because, you know, James later on says that, uh, you know, one that says, thou shalt not steal, uh, you know, do you, do you steal? Do you do those things? Uh, and even if your sin is not the same, it still offended the same God that made that law. Uh, so, but, verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, against them which commit such things. And so the judgment is to people that commit sins, uh, that commit wrongs. It's not judgment is not towards those people that are in or out of a covenant. Uh, it is to those in general who commit wrongs. Uh, and we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, talking about Romans 1, that spiral of sin, Oh, I would never go down that spiral of sin. I'm a good person. Now, th th remember, this is not talking about salvation. This is talking about people that are good and or, or people that think they're good and think that other people are bad. Uh, and judging people based upon their measure of good and bad versus God's measure of righteousness. Uh, he says, or despises, he says, And thinkest thou this old man that judges them which do such things and doest the same as thou shalt escape the judgment of the God. Oh, I, my level of goodness is better than their level of goodness, and so I am escaping the judgment of God, when the judgment of God it, for the escape level would be up here, and we're all under that, you know, we're all under the judgment of God. Uh, and they think that just because uh, I'm right here, and everybody else is right there, God's going to grave on a curve and, and lower that, that bar of judgment down to, for me. But it doesn't work that way. We're all under the judgment of God, and we cannot get above that judgment. It doesn't matter. And now, obviously, there are sins that are worse than another. If you steal a paper clip, it's not a, it's not a bad of a sin as committing murder. <laughs> we all understand that intrinsically. Uh, but they're all under the judgment of God. Uh, and so, in order to get over that that bar of judgment, we need we need Christ, of course. But to, and, and so we, regardless of what level we are, if we're underneath it, we don't get in. Uh, if you will. He says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judge them which do such things, uh, and doest the same, thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance? It's like, stop looking at them, but realize that on your own sins, or your own actions, that the reason why you're not automatically killed, uh, taken away from this earth, not automatically, uh, not automatically cast into the fires of hell, uh, and if you are a child of God already and can't be cast to fires of hell, uh, that you're not just severely punished the instant you make sin. 
is because God is, whether you are saved or unsaved, just based upon your, your actions, uh, God is uh, in His goodness and forbearance. He's long-suffering. Even though you deserve it now, He's going to wait until you get right, until you enter into that state of humbleness. Uh, he's long-suffering, not knowing that you guys don't even consider that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Uh, he's, he's saying, you're despising the riches of God's goodness, thinking that, well, if I'm not punished, then I must be good. No, you're not punished because God is good, and God is long-suffering. You know, so we can't judge on whether or not we've been chastised yet, or whether or not uh, God has uh, judged us yet on whether or not we're good. Uh, because God's long-suffering kind of negates that, uh, and, and so forth. He says, verse 5, But after thy hardness and imputed it heart. So what's the problem? It's not the problem with God. It's the problem that you don't want to get right with God. You, you don't want to humble yourself. Your, your heart is hardened, and it is impudent. Uh, he, you're not, you're, you're not uh, willing to change. You're not willing to have that change of mind. You're not willing to be penitent. Uh, so if you're in... In penitent, see that? If you take the I am there, what do you got? Penitent, right? And so repent is the, is the turning of that, but this is the not turning of that. Uh, so after thy hardness and, and unturning heart, traitors up unto thyself wrath against the wrath of revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So you know where God's level is. You know that if you commit one sin, you're guilty of it all. You know because... Uh, because not the level of sin you do, but rather it is who you offend that matters. Uh, and because you don't want to do righteous yourself, you're justifying your sin by pointing and looking at everybody else's level of sin and saying, well, at least I'm not as bad as them, so God should grade on a curve. Uh, but no, God has a perfect level of righteousness, and He wants you to repent. He wants you to turn your heart. He, he wants you to soften your heart and be penitent. He wants you to turn back to a state of humility. Uh, you're treasuring, by not being in a state of humility, whether you're saved, whether you're lost, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, if you are not in a state of humility, uh, God's judgment will be upon you. If you are an unbeliever, and you're, you're condemned, ready to go to hell, and God's judgment is upon you. If you're a believer, then God's chastisement will be upon you, uh, if you are not humble. Uh, because it's not about the amount of sins that you do, but it's about the state of your heart. If your heart is imputed in, it's going to be one that will consistently commit sin, and sin, and sin, and sin. So it's not about the number of sins you commit, but it's the state of your heart that will or will not commit sins. Uh, and in fact, even when your heart is in a state of humbleness, you may transgress the law, but then you'll realize it and you'll quickly uh, call out to the Lord for forgiveness. Uh, that's the state that God is looking for, not the level of, of deeds that you do. He says, the wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, so we know these things, uh, and is revealed to them. Uh, verse 6 uh, explains the judgment of God, is that who will render to every man according to his deeds. If you do good things, he's going to give you good things. If you do bad things, he's going to give you bad things. You know, uh, cause and effect. Uh, to them, by patient continuance in well doing, seek for glory, honor, and mortality, eternal life. So what he's saying here is that if you, as a little child, and you're born, God created you perfect and upright, and then, and then, of course, we're underneath the sin, of course. But, uh, but if you've not sinned yet, and if you've not turned from the way, uh, that you, as a perfect little child, uh, and you continue in that, this theoretically now, because we've all gone out of the way, we've all, we've all strayed from that, uh, as we know, of course, in verse 12 of chapter, chapter 3, it says, they are all gone out of the way, they are all together become unprofitable, there is none to do with good, no, not one. So, so technically, if you were, you're born, and then, and then you are uh, continuing in goodness, and you're obeying your parents, you're doing what's right, and you're continuing in that goodness, then whoever render to the man according to his deeds, that your, your deeds are continually good and never bad, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and mortality, eternal life, so in knowledge you're seeking for those righteous things, uh, and, 
and then you're going to receive those things if you continue patiently. Uh, so an innocent child, when they die in, in innocence, if they've continued in that, they are going to receive uh, glory, honor, and mortality, eternal life. That's what the, the innocent little child who has no knowledge of sin and stays in that proper way that God made him will continue in that. But unto them that are contentious, in other words, you didn't stay in that. You, you, when you knew to do right, you went and had did wrong. You entered into a state of rebellion. You never continued in that humble state of, of being good before your parents and doing righteous deeds and things that you're supposed to do. Uh, you are contentious. Contentious means this is what you're supposed to do, and you contend with it. You're like, I don't want to do that. So contentious does not necessarily mean that you actually do a wrong action. But contentious, what it means is that you're humble, you're before the Lord, and then you hear something that you don't want to do. And then you contend with it. But I don't want to do that. That's not what I like. That's not what you were contentious. And that takes you out of that state of humility. Because humility is saying, yes, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. That's humility. And when we are contentious, he says, so in other words, if you never, are never contentious and you're humble in that, you're going to receive glory, honor, and mortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, if you're that little child, the moment you become contentious is towards God's things and, and knowing to do right but doing wrong, wanting to do wrong, not even actually doing it but wanting to do it, then your heart becomes contentious, then you go out of the way. And do not obey the truth. And that See, it starts with the contentious and where you're state of mind turns from humility, from penitence to impotence, uh, and hardening your heart to the things of God, and then you obey not the truth by your actions, uh, by, but obey unrighteousness. Now you're turning not only just from the actions of righteousness, but you intentionally turn to the actions of unrighteousness, uh, indignation, and wrath. So if you become contentious, if you leave that state of humility that God has created you in, made you upright, and see, but you seek your own inventions, your own things, then you will receive of God indignation and wrath. He's going to be not happy with you. Ig ig however that word is. Indignant. Ig Indignation. How do you say that? And wrath. He's going to be angry with you. And then tribulation. Why do we as people on this earth have tribulation? is because we're reaping from the cause and effect of wickedness in everybody else's life. And anguish. Uh, why do we have pain in the world? It's because it, somebody else caused an action that causes a response and, and, and causes pain. Upon every soul of man that doeth evil. So he's explaining this, regardless of your covenant, to the Jew first and also the Gentile. In other words... The Jews, as God's servants, as those people under the covenant, not only do they not get a free pass, it's going to be to you first. God's going to start his judgment at the house of God. He's going to start with his servants. He's going to start with the physical people of God. Uh, and if they are wicked, then they're going to be judged first. And so that's what he's explained to the Jew first. So the message goes to you first, and then you also uh, get the judgment first. And also the Gentiles. Gentiles don't get a free pass because, oh, I didn't know. And then he explains it again also. Uh, but glory, honor, and peace to every man. So he, in other words, he started out, but those that leave the path, regardless of whether you're Jew or Gentile, uh, are going to receive indignation and wrath. But then every, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. So even if you've left the path and you continue to work good, you're still going to receive glory, honor, and peace. Uh, and, and so sometimes you have people that have left that path, but they're somewhat decent people. They, get, they reap these things <clears throat> to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. So it doesn't matter if you're in the National Covenant or you're not in the National Covenant uh, or in a covenant with the Lord or not. Uh, you get the same actions, cause and effect. Uh, for as many as have sinned without the law, if you've never had the law of Israel, or you've never been in that law, you don't know what God's law says, shall also perish without the law. Because here, here's why. why. Why if you didn't know the law? He says, 
As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So it doesn't matter if you had the law or you didn't have the law. For the hearers of the law are, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, if you've heard it or you didn't hear it, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So in other words, if you continued whether you knew the law or not, you'll be justified. Or as they say today, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, to do by nature, he says, for when the Gentiles, he's explaining people that don't have the law, that have not the law, do by nature the things that things contained in the law. You know, not being covetous, not, not lying, not doing those wrong things. Uh, have not the law are a law unto themselves, which they show of work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. So just as people with knowledge decide to do right and wrong, so too people without knowledge, because they have it written on their hearts, they're a human being, and, and Christ lieth to every man that cometh through the world, uh, he gives that, that witness, the Word of God is a witness in their hearts, uh, that they know to do right. They, they have the ability, if you will, to continue in righteousness, but regardless of what you do, what you know or hear or, or think or, or think you're in or what physical covenant you think you're in, uh, if you're contentious and you leave that, then you're going to have indignation and wrath. You're, you're not going to uh, receive glory and honor and all those things. He says, uh, in the day, and, and so he's saying this long suffering is not, you're eventually going to reap the benefits of the, uh, the benefits or, or the punishments of this, in the day when God, when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So we see in this, in Romans chapter 1, we see the sins that people do, regardless of whether they're in the covenant or out of the covenant, have the law or don't have the law, or, 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 or believing or not believing, uh, you, your actions will be judged in that day. You will be judged by those things that you do, those things that you have done, uh, though, whether or not you continue in that. So according to the law, uh, it's what you continue in. So, God's going to judge people on whether or not their heart is in humility, uh, whether or not they have continued in that righteous path that he set them on, uh, that he created them in. He made every man upright, uh, but they went seeking their own inventions, their own ideas. Uh, he said, so, so that's what he's waiting on. He's waiting to see, will you continue in that way, or will you be contentious? And so that, that's what that life is, is for, to see what you will do before the Lord. Uh, and so, and, and then it will be judged. It, he won't be long-suffering forever. And so we, we could continue on in that, but, but basically that verse 5 there, uh, the reason why they go out of the path is because they harden their heart and they become impenitent. Uh, and they, in that impenitence, they treasure up wrath unto themselves. So that's why we need to repent. We need to go back into penitence before the Lord uh, because that impenitence is where the sins are treasured up. So whether if you're a lost person and you are <coughs> impenitent, that's where you treasure up your evil deeds in that state of impenitence. Uh, if you are a saved person, but you are an impenitent person, that's where you treasure, treasure up your chastisement against, uh, that God has against you. And so if you, whether you're a humble person, if, if, if you don't know the law, the things of God, you're not saved, but you continue in that way, you're not going to treasure up wrath against yourself, uh, even, even if you're not saved, you can still st continue in innocence. So if you, even as an unbeliever, uh, are humble, even if you don't know that you're humble before God, uh, you will still receive glory, honor, and peace uh, until you are impenitent. So it's, it's, it's not like, but it's not going to be like, uh, oh, here's my, here's my treasured up evil things, and here's my treasured up glory things. It doesn't work like that. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, my good thing, my glory, honor, and peace with God is, is all up here. But then the thing is that the moment you impenitent yourself as a lost person, uh, even if it's only one day in your life, all that glory, honor, and peace that you treasured up, that one thing that you treasured up as an impenitent person in that state of impenitence is going to cause you to go to hell. Because it's not a measuring thing. It's a, uh, if you continue 
in it. Not if you, uh, but the moment you turn from it is the moment you sin and the moment you become uh, the, the judgment of God upon sinners, uh, it comes into your life. So, so that's explained there, and we're going to go ahead and go into the second instance of, of repent. And of course, there's a lot more we could talk about there in, in that state, but verse 5 there, uh, <clears throat> verse 4 and 5 are the key aspects of what you treasure up or don't treasure up. And looking over to Romans chapter 11, verse 29, we're going to continue on to this thought about Gentiles receiving mercy and Jews receiving mercy, and why is it that um, there, there's this continued contention between Jews and Gentiles even today uh, in their unbelief. Romans chapter 11, verse 29, says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So in other words, God uh, gives gifts, and then he doesn't change his mind about those gifts. This, this is moving on from where we're leading us to repentance, where we change our mind about God and about sin and, and ungodliness, and it's changing the focus toward to, to God. So the promises of God. Why is it that the goodness of God leads us to repentance? It's because if he calls on you and says, hey, all, on God, all, all lost people, here's the gospel. Anyone who receives it can be saved. And, and, then, uh, and then they say, okay, I'm going to receive it, and, and I humble myself, and I receive the gospel, and then God sees somebody who received the gospel, ah, oh, no, I didn't mean you. I changed my mind about you. Oh, that's not a good thing. That's not a good situation, right? And so the goodness of God, the fact that he doesn't repent of his promises and his deeds, uh, guarantees us our covenants, our, our salvation, uh, and all those things. And so that's what Romans 12 or, or 11.29 is, is going to teach us. 11.29, he says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And let's go over to... Uh, let's go ahead and go to chapter 11 and we'll try to... We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, I say then, hath God cast away his people... For God forbid, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So in this chapter he's talking about uh, the children of Israel uh, as being God's people, physically. Not spiritually, but physically, because uh, he prefaces this with, has God cast away his people, he says, God forbid, for I also am, and then he does, I'm a spiritual Israelite. No, he says, I am a physical uh, Israelite after the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He doesn't say after the faith of Abraham, but he says after the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now, of course, you know, the other parts of this path, of other passages talking about election, uh, the foreknowledge of God conforming to the image of his son. Uh, and so we understand that the people that are, and in this passage we're talking about the elects a little bit, uh, is that the Jewish people that believe uh, continue in into these promises even though the, they get scattered or whatever. Uh, he says, uh, For God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Uh, he didn't cast them away from him. Uh, the, the, the physical people that have faith in the Lord. Uh, what not that what the scripture saith of Elias, how that he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. And I am left alone that seek thy life. See, unbelieving Israel uh, killed the prophets, killed the people of the church, killed the people uh, that were trying to tell, turn them back to the Lord. But what saith the answer of God unto him? Oh yeah, that Israel, I'm going to cast them away. I'm going to forget my promises to that nation, the physical nation, even though that they've gone off into unbelief. Now, of course, uh, the generations that went into belief, he didn't give them promises, but, and that's a different story. Uh, but... Uh, I have reserved unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So in this nation of Israel, physically, there are 7,000 spiritual Jewish people that have not turned from the Lord, and God has reserved them to continue that line of the, of the physical covenant. And so even though all of these wicked Israelites that are killing God's people are going to be cast into hell... The 7,000 that are reserved are going to preserve that covenant through. Just like that first generation, that old generation uh, that, refused, that God refused to give promises to, uh, 
their children were preserved and in faith were able to obtain the promises on behalf of the nation so that Israel as a nation continued on even though that wicked generation did not. So too is that election of grace. Those believing Israel that is in the church and, and, and in faith, uh, they have continued on with the Lord will be able to renew that uh, will be able to renew that actual uh, covenant of Israel. Uh, he says, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and seek my life. But what saith the answer of God to him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time, he's talking about his present time, the Jewish people and Israel at, at the time of, of Paul. Even so, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. In other words, there is Jewish people that are saved and are believers who have obtained the promises of Israel. And if by grace, it is no more, he says, according to the election of of grace. In other words, God gives it to them as a promise for their for for them. You know, the people in Israel, even when they die, uh, their lot or inheritance in that land, when the resurrection comes and God restores his kingdom, they will have an inheritance in that land even though they die or pass away or or, or if at their time Israel was scattered. So even if Israel uh, is dispersed in the New Testament time, that there was a believing Israelite that had the covenant of Israel, uh, you know, the circumcision of the flesh, and he believed, then that person in the resurrection is still going to have a lot or an inheritance in his tribe in the land of Israel. So if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace, but otherwise, uh, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blind. In other words, the believing Israelites obtained the promises of God for their nation, and the rest of unbelieving Israelites were blinded so that they'll fall away, just like that old generation versus the new generation that entered into the promised land of Moses. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. In other words, even Israel, if Israel does not believe, then they will not obtain the promises later on, because they have no faith. Uh, let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. I say then, so if that's their state as a nation, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. So, the individuals may have stumbled, but the nation is not going to fall. Uh, it's going to continue on. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for it to provoke them to jealousy. See, the problem is, especially in Acts chapter 15, 21, you see this problem where the Jewish believers uh, got their theology mixed up, and these Judaizers were trying to say, uh, well, in order for you to be saved, you need to enter into the Jewish covenant. And that became a stumbling block to a lot of people because they were willing to accept Christ, but they didn't want to keep the sacraments, or not sacraments, but the, the laws and the ordinances and, and all those things that went with the Jewish covenant or the Israelite covenant. They didn't want to enter into that nation, forsake their own nation, because uh, they, they Gentiles, uh, would, would, would have had to enter into the, uh, the Israelite or the Jewish national covenant before they could receive Christ, and that was an obstacle. So, in other words, to stop that, to prevent that from happening, uh, as it was happening in, in Paul's day, uh, God caused the nation as a whole to be blinded to the truth, but that as individuals could enter into the church, they would be uh, believers, but the nation itself would be dispersed, and, and that covenant would be put on hold, because it was an obstacle to the Gentiles receiving grace. He says, let their eyes be darkened. Uh, and so now the fall of them be the riches of the world. In other words, he's chosen to blind the Jewish national people uh, as a nation so that this obstacle, so he chose to blind these people so that many more could receive salvation. Uh, and that's why the nation of Israel is not here because they tried to make an obstacle uh, to salvation. They, they're not supposed to do that. 
So now the fall is going to be riches of the world. So because that obstacle is no longer there to enter into the Jewish covenant, it can now go through the whole world rather than just sticking with Israel. For I speak unto you Gentiles, and so much I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I might imagine my office, but by many means I may provoke to immolation them which are of my flesh, they might save some of them. In other words, they could come into the church and, and not allow that to be an obstacle. And the casting away of them be reconciled in the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Uh, and so it talks about how that they can also receive salvation, eternal salvation, even though their covenant as a nation is put on hold. And then, and then, as referring to that nation, verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, the, the nation, but as, and those that are blinded. But as touching the election, they are beloved for their father's sake. In other words, the nation is elected uh, to, to fulfill covenants. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The nation itself are still going to receive their promises. For as in times past you have not believed God, yet you have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, these also now have not believed that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all, whether Jew or Gentile, in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So in other words, salvation has not, nothing to do with your covenant, but that everybody who does not believe is in unbelief, and everybody has to receive it equally the same. For God, has, So even though they receive their promises as a nation, they don't receive the promises of eternal life just because they have promises of the nation. Uh, and those, they as a nation were dispersed so that the, the gospel could have free reign to all people. Uh, and so that state of repentance uh, applies to all people, and God makes sure that you keep your promises uh, for believing Israel even though they are dispersed uh, when the kingdom returns. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given him, that it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Don't think yourself anything more than you ought, because all things are about God, and what he does, rather than what we think we are uh, entitled to. Because God will remove you, he'll blind you, if you think that entitles you to anything. Let's go ahead and finish there. And consider that repentance is about having a penitent heart and not think that our covenants have anything to do with our salvation. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you bless you again this Lord. I pray that you'll continue to guide and bless us as, as we do your will and help us understand the importance of having a penitent heart before you uh, so that we will not treasure up wrath until the day of uh, redemption, but uh, that you will... Uh, that you will preserve us and, and keep us humble and help us do what's right. Just not pray. Amen.